Welcome to our seventh and final overview video for ARC 331 and ARC 332. And some of the things we're going to touch on here uh, provide a preview of topics that will be included in a new course um, at the 500 level dealing with form generated structures. In this final segment, we're going to talk about the three quarters of the two courses, the two course sequence that follow after the initial foray into structural design. So for the second half of ARC 331 and for all of ARC 332, we're going to focus on deepening the knowledge base and also validating the guidelines for spans and proportions, which are used in the initial foray. We talked previously about some key topics for ARC 331 and 332, some of which were conceptual in nature. These were part of the initial foray where we had experimental demonstrations of key structural concepts and behaviors to help students under, understand structural behavior without getting too deep into numbers. We talked about conceptualizing a structure as a system of parts selected and assembled in a manner to resist all the vertical forces and all the horizontal forces in all directions. We talked about conceptualizing a structure to address an intended architectural purpose. And finally, we talked about applying guidelines for the spans and proportions of common spanning members, such as beams, trusses, rigid frames, and so forth. Now, all of that qualitative or conceptual information was an integral part of the initial foray into structural design. So the remainder of ARC 331, the second half, and all of ARC 332 is going to focus on more quantitative and rigorous subject matter. So we'll delve in depth into the properties of structural materials, how to apply loads to a structure, tracing forces through a structure, sizing tension members, sizing columns, applying span tables, load tables, and sizing procedures to size beams and trusses. And by the way, in the process, verifying some of the key guidelines for spans and proportions. We'll use spreadsheets to organize and carry out both structural and economic computations. We'll use computer simulations to creatively explore structural behavior and also to show an alternative way of sizing members, uh, an alternative to span tables, load tables, and other uh, longhand sizing procedures. We'll be developing concepts for integrating the structural, thermal, and daylighting systems We'll address tectonics and connections between structural members and the things that the structural members are supposed to support. We'll talk about codes and standards and finally economics of spans. One of the big things that architects have to think about is the longer the free span, the more easily space is developed and reconfigured in a really convenient and economic way but longer spans also uh, entail more money. So the structure becomes more expensive and heavier. Um, often though, architects have really um, very incorrect notions about how cost and span are related to each other. So we're going to quantify that in a way that will make it helpful for making design decisions in the context of the economics of everything that goes into the building. So we're going to talk about sizing columns. We'll look at some tables that allow us for any situation we might encounter to size steel pipe columns, um, hollow steel sections. This table shows some 12 by 12 sections with 5 8 inch wall, half inch wall, 3 8 inch wall, and so forth. Each of these tables contains the maximum allowable axial load or safe design load for any given effective length of the column. We have similar tables for 
for wide flange columns. In this case, we're looking at W10 by, so that would be 10 inches deep by 112 pounds per foot or 68 pounds per foot or 49 pounds per foot. These are amazing tables. All the numbers have been pre-processed and in a very short period of time, if we know the axial force in the column, we can come up with a safe and, and minimal weight column for any situation that we might be dealing with. After we've sized columns, we're going to apply span tables, load tables, and sizing procedures to size beams and trusses. And as we said in the process, verifying some of the key guidelines for spans and proportions so that everyone understands in the end where those guidelines came from. So for example, we'll size wide flange steel beams. We have tables that allow us to figure out what moment of inertia is necessary, and we can find the lightest beam with an adequate moment of inertia to be stiff enough to be serviceable as a floor beam or as a roof beam. We also have tables that allow us to find the lightest weight beam that will be safe against moment failure under the factored 1.2 times the self-load plus 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. These load factors are to give us a margin of safety so that when we reach the final load, we don't actually have a building that fails. We'll look at the sizing of both truss joists and truss girders, and we'll have a whole host of tables that allow us to account for both strength and stiffness in that sizing procedure. We'll use the computer in some demonstrations. We don't do a whole lot of that, but we use it as a demonstration tool in lectures, and students will go through a certain number of uh, um, explorations using this tool as a way of sizing structural members. And in the simple examples that are given in ARC 332, students will devise a geometry for a simple frame system consisting of roof joists, roof girders, floor joists, and floor girders, and so forth. They'll learn how to come up with the effective areas or influence areas for joists, perimeter girders, and interior girders. And then they'll apply those loads um, in the computer simulation. So first of all, they will decide on uh, guesses at the sizes of beams. And in this case, this shows the self-weight, so you'll notice in the left-hand corner here, it's talking about the self-weight of the joist, the girders, and the columns. So that's one load case. And the beauty to the software that we're going to use to do this computation is once we've assigned a certain specific beam, the software pulls up all the properties of that beam, does all the structural analysis, and accounts for the self-weight of that beam in the process. So we have the self-weight. We will apply a dead load, a live load. The computer will then combine those together into a factored load of 1.2 times self plus 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times live. And we can analyze the floor under that combined load. We'll look at deflection under live load to make sure that the floor doesn't move too much and that it's not a perceptual problem for people. People really don't like floors that are too flexible. And as an engineer, I often point out that they get out on a diving board and it doesn't bother them at all that the diving board moves. But when they are in a building, they associate a floor that moves with a floor that's weak. That's not necessarily true. You can have a floor that's pretty flexible and still be pretty strong. But this issue of people's perception and them finding movement of the floor distracting is a concern that has to be addressed. So we will size all of our structures to meet some deflection criteria or some stiffness criterion 
that is likely to produce satisfied customers. We'll also look at bending stresses and size the beams to make sure that the bending stress is not excessive. Now, we can also use the computer simulation for more creative exploration. So everything I showed previously was a simple frame system consisting of joist girders and columns. We can do more complex things. For example, we can look at um, parallel cord trusses and we can look at them as a function of the length of cantilevers. So here we're seeing a simulation and we're looking at deflection. And by the way, I want to emphasize in all these deflection diagrams, the deflection has been drastically exaggerated so that we can, we can observe structural behavior. So in the case of this truss, for example, the actual deflection would be not discernible in this image. So we've exaggerated it so that we can see what it's like. For example, we want to compare that deflection to that one, to that one, to that one. And by exaggerating them, we can begin to see that this is actually a very low amount of deflection out at the tip here, but much more so there. We can also look at the axial forces. So dark gray here means axial compression. Light gray means axial tension. And we begin to see a very interesting pattern of the variation of those along the length of this truss. We can use the computer to analyze bow trusses. Uh, in this case, this bow truss uh, has a top cord which is curved along an arc of a circle. We can analyze a parabolic arch such as the Broadgate Exchange House. We can compare these things. So for example, here we have parabolas, a shallow parabola, a deep parabola, an arc of a circle, and in this case, a semicircle and an ellipse. We'll tend to call all of those arches, but the reality is this is the only one, the parabolas are the only ones that are acting in true compression, and there are huge bending stresses associated with a semicircular structure or this elliptical structure. We will all fall prey to calling them arches, but in fact, the bending stresses here are drastically higher than the axial stresses, so it's not really behaving like an arch in, in the purest sense of the word. So these diagrams were generated by our computer simulation program. We can kind of check some of the issues by building models. This is a parabolic arch. Uh, this is the centering on which it was assembled, and the centering has been pulled down. The arch is supporting itself just fine. Uh, we can push this in from the side and we'll begin to see cracks developing, but then it's well enough behaved that when the finger is taken away, it returns back to its original shape. A semicircle, on the other hand, is nowhere near as well behaved. This is showing the semicircle resting on the centering. This is after the centering has been lowered slightly. And it's quite clear here that this so-called arch is going to collapse under its own self-weight. Huge cracks are developing here and there, and there are also cracks developing on the bottom part up near the top. So our experimental model is substantiating what we're discovering from our computer simulation. We also get feedback on this phenomenon from classical architecture. This is a semicircular so-called arch that has been shaken around in earthquakes and you'll notice that it's beginning to develop tension cracks on the bottom here and tension cracks on the outside there and the only reason it was ever able to work in the first place is the tendency to bulge outward here is being inhibited by all this material which has been wedged in here and over here to help inhibit that but as all this material moves around this semicircular element is beginning to reveal its defects by opening up cracks on the bottom here and cracks on the outside there. If we could build this out of some better material that has tensile capacity, then we wouldn't have to worry quite so much about this and that problem because it would be taken care of by the tensile properties of the material. So for example, we can build a semicircular 
uh, element like this out of steel and it will work just fine because the steel is able to handle compression wherever that occurs and tension wherever the tension occurs. And furthermore, we can use our computer analysis tools to figure out exactly how deep this thing needs to be and how heavy the uh, top flange or the top cord and the bottom cord of this semicircular element need to be in order to function correctly. We can start doing some really interesting things in three dimensions, which we could never do very effectively using longhand calculation because there are just too many equations to solve and human beings make too many mistakes. So here is a network dome consisting of a series of pipes that would be connected together with some sort of fitting at the joints. When we do the analysis of that, we are plotting here some what we call flags, the size of which is an indicator of the intensity of whatever variable we're looking at. So in this case, the yellow represents compression stress, axial stress in the members, and blue represents tension stress. So you'll notice all the elements up above a certain point here are all acting in compression. But when we come down far enough on this, the tendency of this to bulge outward becomes significant. And now all of these horizontal elements in this circle are like a tension ring. So we have tension in these members and we have tension in those members that are keeping this dome from bulging outward and collapsing. Not unlike what this arch is trying to do when some of this material that's bracing it and holding it in place begins to shake loose. One of the powerful tools we have is to look at deformation of the structure. Again, I emphasize these deformations have been drastically exaggerated so we can look at them. And what we see here is under these gravity loads, in this case it's snow load, the top of the dome is beginning to uh, move downward and flatten out. And in this zone, it's bulging outward. So we can see why these members and these members are in tension and why we see that reflected here as a very substantial tension force or tension stress in all those members. We can use this tool as an exploratory tool to ask ourselves what happens when we vary the geometry. For example, what if we start taking parts away? So here we have a dome where a bunch of these members down around the bottom have been removed. So that those two members have been removed and those two removed. And then in the next diagram, we've also begun to remove some of these elements right here. We can go through an analysis of this structure. And what we see is we have the original structure here with the tension ring there and a tension ring here. Uh, the tension ring is a little different now. These members have a little less tension in them and these have more. What's also happening is there was a nice distribution of force in all these members. Now we have half as many of them, so the members that remain have twice as much force. And now we're beginning to see really dramatic tension forces right here. But what's really striking is that when you look at this and do this analysis for bending stress, this is still behaving like a well-behaved dome because it has all the tension rings it needs. This is still a well-behaved uh, dome because it has all the tension rings it needs. It's just loading up these members a bit more so they have to be thicker walled or heavier members. What's really striking though are the bending stresses which are occurring in this structure when we eliminate one of these tension rings. And those bending stresses, by the way, are much larger than any of these axial stresses. So what that tells us is that removing all these parts um, has left us with a dome that's not very dome-like. It's got lots of bending stress in it, and we need to think about some other way to deal with it. Um, this also shows those three under wind loading. And you'll notice the huge deformations that are also occurring here um, under that load. Excuse me a second. I want to make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Okay. 
So that's the deformation under wind load, and this is the bending stress under wind load. And now we're seeing this dome, which we thought was pretty well behaved, is not doing so well. Um, and you can kind of see why that is, because under wind load, this ring right here is beginning to warp in and warp out. So this analysis tool is incredibly powerful. It would allow us, for example, to analyze this uh, Scopes Dome in Norfolk, Virginia. Here is the um, Expo 67 Dome in Montreal, which is a kind of geodesic dome based on the spherical icosahedron. And also this structure, which is at Epcot Center in Disneyland. All these structures can be, in a very straightforward way, analyzed using the computer. This is the Louisiana Superdome, and this is an image that shows the network geometry that's the structure internal to that dome. This can be very easily analyzed on a modern computer. This is another type structure that we can look at and analyze very effectively. This is based on a spherical icosahedron, uh, excuse me, a spherical cube. This is a spherical icosahedron. This is an example of that that's actually built. And we can also devise totally new dome geometries that have never been reported in the literature and sit and explore them and optimize them in terms of performance and amount of material. Another interesting structure that we can look at is a portion of a toroid. So here we can look at the outside of a toroid, or in this case, the inside, which creates a kind of saddle surface, which was the underlying geometry for this band shell the Schubert band shell in Minnesota, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. We can use the computer to look at hyperbolic paraboloids. Several hyperbolic paraboloids knit together. Hyperbolic paraboloids that are knit together and strangely warped, but warped in a way where they meet smoothly at the connections. We can do warped hyperbolic paraboloids, which have been smoothly knitted together and then split apart again to allow the uh, access to light from the sky. The computer can be used to analyze cross vaults or this structure, which in addition to being hyperbolic paraboloids knit together is also a cross vault geometry. And this structure, which is both hyperbolic paraboloid cross vault geometry and also has these curious openings which occur at surprising locations in the structure. Anything that we can define mathematically, we can analyze using these computer tools. And in fact, we can analyze any structure even if it cannot be defined mathematically in the form of an algorithm. So for example, the Bilbao Museum, which was designed by Frank Gehry and engineered by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Literally, the location of every joint in this structure was agreed upon between the architects and the engineers, and there was no mathematical algorithm to define any of those locations. And yet, this structure is actually, when you look at it carefully, it's a very rational structure which can be very easily analyzed in the computer. So these computer tools are unbelievably powerful and creative tools. And we're not going to use them too extensively for assignments in 332. But as I said, there is going to be a follow on course that focuses on all of these complex geometries and how we explore those using the computer. So that ends our seventh overview video focusing on the deepening of our knowledge base and validating the guidelines for spans and proportions.